You all sure come here, ooh, it's loud. Uh, you all sure come here to hear about the outage of Ascent, right? It's always fun to hear a good struggling story as long as it's not yours. <laughs> so, yes, pretty cool. So, well, you will hear it. You will hear how I felt the outage. You will hear my perspective of it. And hopefully, you will also come out of this presentation with knowing the strategies we used, well, to modernize the cloud, to make developers happier, to well, make, make their code faster, well, not code faster, sorry, <laughs> to make them, well, more free to, to explore, and also you'll learn some techniques to implement zero trust network. Uh, we will hear how we uh, made, how we reduce blast radios, and all that cool stuff. So, come along with me. Uh, my name is Nicolas Braga. I'm a cloud solution architect at Ascent. And, well, let's give it a try, right? Before we start, guys, just, a, just some questions, right? Who knows here what are some cool sources of outages? What do you do? What breaks a software? What makes an outage? Humans. Humans, that's true. But maybe, yes? Back machinery in the data center. <laughs> that's true, that's true as well. Why? I think one of the common sources of outages, oh, that's very abstract, right? The software change. Yeah, you can break a software if you do a software changes. You test it, of course you test. You're very confident it will work. You go through your pipeline, and then, well, you put it on production, it breaks, right? That's one, uh, one way of uh, making an outage, very cool one, because you can always roll back and then have it back running. Uh, is there any other? Any other? I, I planned three here. There are probably more, right? Yes, yeah, a hardware change. That's, uh, that's indeed. Maybe a hardware change. If you do change a hardware, maybe you, you want a bigger instance. Maybe you want to uh, change the database type or, well, just the CPU uh, a family, right? You can, uh, you can always uh, create an outage out of it. Uh, guys, let me give you a cool tip on this one. If you're using infrastructure, if you're not yet using infrastructure as code, you're missing out a very big opportunity to sleep well on that Friday night after the very cool deployment, right? But that is another uh, common source of outage, and this one, in my opinion, is one of the most scary ones. Did anyone know about this one? No? no? Yes? People. Ah, people, that's right. So, usage patterns. That's people, right? A sudden spike in, in your uh, workload can create an outage. You immediately think of a DDoS, right? Oh, well, well I'm not expecting this traffic. That is a huge a load on my platform. It's a DDoS. What when it's not? So what and it's legitimate traffic? What do you do? How do you recover from that? So if after that, let's just go to our outage. What you're seeing here are news from the television, from journals, and those are news about the outage at Ascent. So they, they were pretty impressive. Outages, they can trigger and press different buttons on you. The way you feel an outage, sorry? The way you feel an outage depends pretty much on how mature you are, the experience you have, uh, depends as well on well, the position of the company. Is it a company that is on spotlight? Is it critical? Do you need to explain yourself if you have an outage? Are you risking losing clients because of it? It all matters, right? It also matters the time of the issue. So is it on a peak load? Do you need to solve it very fast? Or is it like 3 a.m. on a Saturday and you, well, you can just sleep and fix it tomorrow? Right, so it all matters. In my case, I had faced enough outages in my life. I even created some big ones. I'm very proud of that. Uh, but, well, I thought I had enough scares to scare an outage. Well, that's what I thought, because I haven't faced this before. So, what is the story there? I was just a month in, in the company. 
was still learning, uh, still trying to understand uh, the landscape, getting to know the people. Very cool office. And it was all good until we started seeing very worried faces. People looking at the screens, people calling each other and checking. At the first, I was like, yeah, very cool. Something interesting is happening. I asked it around, oh, no, it's for the delivery teams. They're going to manage it. It's just an outage. They, uh, the, the time has passed. I was like, yeah, well, let's, let's try to help them. I, I can help. I have enough experience. Let's, let's see what we do. We try to, well, check the metrics, seeing uh, what's going on. We saw it's a big, big load, so let's try to increase the machines. Machines are somehow not responding. So we increased one side. The other just went down. Something was wrong. It's, it was not working. We managed to bring it back online a couple times, lasted for a couple hours, sometimes minutes, and it went down again. We didn't know what was going on. Passed some days, and then we start seeing some news. Oh, ascent is out. Ascent is out. Something, something hap something's happening. Something big is going on. And at one point, so many people start calling our data centers. Guys, we have an entire floor for a call center. And we had to shut it down. The business decided to shut down the data center because of the amount of people calling on it. So it was huge. At that time, I knew I had never faced it before. So of course, we fixed it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking about how on the scent Spark how an outage spark the full rethink of a center cloud architecture, right? So we fixed it. Before I say how we fixed it, let's take a look into what it what caused the outage actually. It was triggered by rise in energy prices caused by the Ukrainian war. For a very long time, energy wasn't something very interesting. We could People would look into, into the application once or twice a month to see how much they, they're uh, spending energy, and that was fine, right? Because of the Ukrainian war, it was very much on the spotlight now. So people would go turn on the microwave to warm the pasta and immediately run to the app and see, oh, how much it costs to warm my pasta. I know that because I did it myself. I think everyone did it, right? Uh, at, at one point, everyone was like, obsessed about the data and, and how much they were consuming on it. So we had an unprecedentedly high load. Guys, I tried to find the metrics. I tried to find the graphics of it. You won't believe. I couldn't find it, unfortunately. But we had a very normal load with the peaks, uh, ups, and downs. And when this happened, our load was so high that those ups and downs, they were a flat line. They were a, truly a flat line. If you look into the graphics, they are flat. It was impressive. And the load was there to stay. This was a big topic. We're not going down. We're not reducing the load. And we were not prepared. Our landscape just couldn't support it. Why it couldn't support it? There were some compounding factors. We were a very administrative and cost-efficient company. We were thinking on how to minimize IT, how we could sell the most with the minimum IT on it. It caused some limited scalability. scalability sorry. Uh, we were not scaling horizontally. We were scaling uh, vertically. So there were some limitations in it. And because we are, were an administrative company, we also created a tightly coupled architecture because it's just easier, right? Creating a tightly coupled architecture is easy. You just build it. It's fine. So it was very fragile. Uh, the reason why our services were going down is because the very first service goes down, it overloads the other, and it creates a chain effect. So everything was going down. And it was very over-restrictive. Our developers, they had very little visibility into what was going on. Everybody was on the same bucket. Guys, we had four accounts. Four accounts for 2017. So it was production, develop, acceptance, and test. Everybody on the same bucket. You need to be restrictive. If you're not, if you open your arms, you're going to probably hit your friend. Also. So, so the developer teams, development teams, they had to be, uh, well, they had to be a bit of uh, restrictive so, so people won't go over it. Cool. So with this, those, those were the source of the outage. So 
how do you recover from such situation? We try to reboot, we tried bigger instance, bigger databases, nothing works. We know the load is there to stay, and we know the landscape won't support it. So what do you do? What, how do you recover from such situation? What do we do? What, what do you do when you go to that selling web page that is selling one Madonna ticket and there are 1,000 people to buy it? A queue, maybe? A queue, guys. So a queue, a, it's a way of DDoSing yourself, right? During a week of outage, we acquired data, and we knew how much our landscape could support. So a queue was a way to prevent our landscape to actually get overloaded. So we went after it. We created two firefighting teams, one that would go after a market solution for a queue, and the other one that would create a queuing uh, mechanism ourselves. I, of course, went for the creating the queuing myself because that's fun, right? So I had a blast of a time working during the night, calling with very, uh, very intelligent people, a uh, soda on my side, some uh, uh, junk food on the other, just going through the night, hackathon uh, style, ad hoc deployment, and all that kind of stuff. Very, very exciting. I loved it. In the morning after, we had a prototype. We had a working solution. But of course, you're not playing with such situation, right? You're not giving chance to look. So the other firefighting team, they also found a solution in the market that would, con that would give us all the metrics and capability we needed. So luckily, yeah, we went for that one. So OK, now our landscape is protected. We know the load. And when you open the app, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm the number 1,035 to, to get into the app. You wait 10 minutes, and you're getting there. It's not optimal, right? But we protected with letting people in. We know we had to improve from that situation. So we also acquired data. We got the five most expensive requests we had, and we rebuilt it. We rebuilt it in lambdas, AWS lambdas, so we could horizontally scale. It was very impressive, guys. We did that in one month. In one month, we increased the capa capability of our landscape by hundreds of times. It was Nice. But this is not the only thing. It, it, we still have a queue in front. It's not actually improving. We can face that again, right? So what do we need to do? We need a long-term solution. We need something that is resilient and robust. And the way we do that is by creating some decoupled architecture, simplifying the environments, and giving more ownership to the teams. Well, lucky me, what you see here is a, a banner uh, we created, what our ambition, what we wanted to see here. In 2025, we have the ambition of becoming a tech company that drives digital energy business. Well, lucky me, a couple weeks uh, before the outage, I had raised a concern that, guys, I think I see something wrong in the landscape. I think I see some policies in there that are over-restrictive. I don't understand why that. There was something called GDS. Do you know what a GDS is? No idea? Huh? It stands for generic data store. What do you host? What type of data you put on a generic data store? Weird, right? Who owns a generic data store? So those type of things, they, they were like, uh, triggering me. Oh, OK, a generic data store, nice. Uh, also, two elaborated uh, policies restrictions. So why is that? That's because multiple things working on the same environment. You need to create policies to let them navigate through the environment without har hurting uh, the colleagues or hurting another team. So you have to be restrictive. Well, turns out that this outage made a very big selling uh, speech for me. I didn't have to do anything else. The business was, well, convinced that we could just, well, we needed to, we needed to change. We need to create something more robust. So we put a lot of effort in it. And I, with that, we accelerated 
uh, a, a transition that was supposed to be done by 2028, we now reduced it into three years. So pretty cool, how do we do that? Well, the more I like to have my ego massaged, I don't, I, I'm not a genius, right? So there are things out in the market that can do, well, at least have some rules for what you do, uh, what, what you can do to transition your company. Azure have one, G Google Cloud have one, Azure also have one. And of course, I have one that is based on WellArchitect Framework from AWS. So AWS WellArchitect Framework stands, well, they have six pillars. The operational excellence pillar, uh, pillar is all about how easy you make to run your infrastructure in the cloud and how easy it is to monitor it. The security pillar is a whole chapter that explains how you make a zero trust network, how do you reduce blast radios, and how you make your software more secure. Reliability one is a contradicting one, in my opinion, because, well, you immediately think, oh, I need to make a software, I need to make an architecture that is never breaking. I think that reliability chapter is all about how do you break gracefully. You're always going to break, right? Ultimately, your software will fail. So design something that supports a failure. That is what this chapter is about. Performance efficiency is about how do you create an environment that can shrink and expand with your load. So you're always performing. And cost optimization, well, I kind of have two sayings for this one. Um, one that is very cool, you don't need a Ferrari uh, to go uh, do groceries, although it may sound very cool to do groceries on a Ferrari, you don't need it, right? And another one, I like this one a bit more, that is, oh, I don't, those are my sayings, right? So uh, if you don't know it, it's fine, I, I know it. Uh, the other saying is about, well, running a marathon on old shoes. Right, yeah, you can do it. You can get it to, to the final line on the old shoes. But hey, if you have invested on a better shoes, you probably do that faster and with less pain in the end, right? So this chapter, I find it all about the right investment to actually be ahead of the market and to actually have a performing architecture. It's, it's very cool. This last chapter, guys, we're going to have uh, speakers at the end today talking about, I need to actually read it. I forgot the name. Um, so this last chapter, ooh, not finding it. Uh, yeah, how Ascent could cloud waste. So in the end of the day, there will be a presentation about how Ascent could, could cloud waste. It's all about this last chapter. Go take a look. But well, fine. If only implementing web architect framework was the solution, I wouldn't have a job, right? So you need to understand the web architect framework or any other type of framework to apply it to your own organization. It's, our organizations are not the same. They all have its peculiarity. So what you see here is a very short snapshot of what we created at Ascent. I can't speak about uh, uh, that in 20 minutes. That's what we have left. So I made a, I divided it, it into four uh, pillars. And conveniently, I named the first one Operation Excellence. Cool. We need to operate better. I used some key concepts in there. I wanted to fail fast. I wanted to recover even faster. There were no ownership, so I want things, I want delivery things to have a better ownership. I want a zero trust management, and I want to simplify the working environments. Things are too tied. They can't, they can't explore. They can't just go do whatever they want. So. Shared environments. As I mentioned before, we had four accounts, and F27 teams working into four accounts is hard. You need to create policies, you need to create boundaries so they don't hurt each other. So the very first step there was to, well, give each team their own uh, account. Guys, we went from four accounts to more than 80 accounts in less than a year, and we aiming for uh, more than 100 accounts to the end of this year. That's quite impressive. That is quite a change. But now, teams have their own environment. They are isolated, and they're not going to harm. They're not, not going to dispute a resource or going to have to fight for uh, resources in the cloud. They have their own environment. And that gave us the opportunity to alleviate, alleviate a bit on the 
uh, policies we give to teams. Previously, we had to craft the policies very exclusively uh, for a team, and we had to do that centralized, so when, when a team needs a new change or when a team needs something else, they had to come to a central team and ask, guys, please change this or please change that. We would have to analyze and see, oh, no, no, this you can do because you would, you would harm another team or so. So it was very costly, a very much, a very big effort to do that. Because now things have their own environment, we could just say, hey, you know what? Now you create your own policy. Now you create your own role, and you tell your deployment that it needs to assume this role. So we went from agents with roles to agents using OpenID connection. This OpenID connection had the only right to assume a role. And assuming this role was tied to the repository who triggered that agent. It is, actually. So it results in the team creating its own deployment role that can only be assumed by a repository that that thing, that thing creates. It creates, it reduces plus radius, and it creates a zero trust deployment. It's very, very cool. Now, we don't need it all, so yeah, go, go for it. You're free to explore. Of course, there are boundaries. I will talk about the boundaries later. But hey, there is still one thing missing. We had four stages to go to production. So you go to dev, then yeah, you're not so sure you test on, on the test environment. You're still not so sure, so you go to acceptance environment. And are you sure that you can go to production? Too many steps, why that? Do we really need it? So to simplify it, we decided to go for two environments only, production and non-production environments. And in order to make it possible, we enforced infrastructure as code so that the repositories, the, sorry, the environments are a mirror of each other. Whatever you have in production, you also have the same environment in development and non-production. So you guarantee that if you deploy something in dev and non-production, and it is working, it is deploying, you guarantee to have it deployed on production as well. So your confidence level goes much higher. And you allow people, you allow things to have feature deployments and test things and do canary releases much faster so they can fail fast. Of course, they will make harm. They will uh, harm themselves. But hey, they are now isolated in, a, in their own environment. Everything they own, they can see and they can fix. You don't anymore create a outage that you do not have control over. So pretty, pretty cool. But that's not all, right? We give things their own environment. We also need to isolate their own network. Previously, again, because we are all in the same bucket, we had a very complex networking uh, infrastructure. We had DMZ, we had private, we have internal, we have public subnets. It's quite a messy, right? You as a developer, you don't want to care about it. You don't, you don't want to know which environment or which which networking you deploy, and sometimes you deploy to one, it doesn't work, you have to call another team. It's too complicated. Also too big. We were running on a class A uh, network, so it's the 8.000 network. Quite big, do we need it? No. So we reduce it to the class B, the 172, 16, 17, 18, the one that you have at home. With that, we can give A isolated networking per team. Each thing have their own uh, network. And to control public access, we have a central hub that allows you to go to the internet, and in there we can have firewalls, uh, flow logs, and everything to protect the public access. But then we could also remove some of the complex layers. We reduce it to two networks only. That's all you need. You need a public if you want to talk to people outside of Ascent. And you need an internal, you need a private network if your load is intended for private use. So that's what we did there. We gave things two networks, public and a private one. In theory, that's sufficient, but in reality, that's not enough. So to cover some edge cases, there were some teams that had a load big enough to don't fit in the class B range. So what we do there, we allow teams in their own account to create their own private network. If they have the need, they probably have the capability as well. So 
If you need to create your own private network, fine, go for it. It's private, and you can only connect it to your own network. This way, we allow teams to expand their networking while they don't risk creating IP conflicts, IP overloading, uh, oh, any. They, they don't risk it. They, they have their own private network. They can grow, but still they are connected to a place that is safe for them. But still, that's not all. We wanted things to be able to communicate with themselves. So I have my private API, and I want another team to consume it. I do not want to put it on the public. It's not intended for public access, but I only have a public and a private, so what do I do? Guys, for this case, we're using a very cool service of AWS. Other providers probably also have it. I know Azure maybe is getting there. But in AWS, you, we make use of VPC Lattice. VPC Lattice is amazing. It's a new AWS service. And it, it focuses in abstracting away the networking layer for you. So you, as a developer, you create your endpoint. It's private to you. You go to Lattice and say, hey, Lattice, this is my endpoint. I need you to ma make it accessible for team B. I don't care which network in the team B is. Team B will just use Lattice as well. And I say, hey, yeah, you can allow networking traffic. You can allow someone to call my endpoint if they are in this account or if they are in this role. With this, we get out of the way for the teams. Teams now can create a contract by themselves. I can go to my other team and say, hey, I need to consume your API, allow it to, to be consumed by my account, and vice versa. So teams now can interact with themselves and can be autonomous. They can create connections without us being interfering on it. Very nice. This created the zero trust networking, reduced blast radio, and all that. Super fun. Things are working now. They're happy with that. They're free to explore. But it's not all, right? We needed a bit of observability. Previously, we had four accounts, but we had multiple tools. We had Grafana, we have Datalog, CloudWatch, many, many observability tools, not a single one to actually look at. We couldn't see the whole landscape. So what do we do? We created the observability account. And we say that every account that we deploy will forward its metrics and its logs to a central place. In this account, we give access to everyone to read every metrics and every logs, but they can only modify their own dashboards. Guys, this is super cool. Everything's super cool, right? This, this is also super cool. So people now can see, inspire, and get inspired by the dashboards of others, but they can also use a metric that doesn't belong to them. So if I, if I have my application and I have a critical data dependency on another team, I probably want to monitor this other service as well, so I know if they are experiencing some performance issue, I can raise some alarms on me as well. Maybe they don't have it, and maybe I can just check on them. So it allows things to be, well, self-organizing and, and to have a visibility of the whole landscape and know and see the flow. That is very, very interesting, and you can well, look at someone else's dashboard and say, oh, wow, that's very cool. I will build something like it. Very nice. This is one of the observabilities. That is a bit more management observability we have. And that is the auditing. Guys, we are owned by Ion. Ion is a big utility and energy company, German company, uh, that controls uh, the energy and utility all over the Europe. We are owned by Ascent. So they provide us uh, with, with all the capabilities we need, all the accounts and everything. And they also own our audit log. They had full access. We didn't have much of interest in that until the outage. So we talked to them. We convinced them, like, yeah, it may be super cool to have access to our own audit as well. And I will give you here one example, one use case why this is good. So you remember I said we don't, we, we have some restriction on things so they can use infrastructure as code only. Well, that is true, but it also creates a problem that it blocks people when they are on the most need. So if I have a outage, 
I probably want to go to production. I want to try to solve it as fast as possible. I don't want to be locked out. So we created something called the break glass roll. You use it when you have an outage, and you have full God mode on that account. You can do whatever you want, and you need to do that fast. So it's a very critical role to use. It's a very scary role to have. So because our trace is going to this audit log, the security team can inspect on those traces, and they can say they can have alarms, and this is one of the alarms, that when this role is assumed, we trigger an alert in the entire organization saying who accessed it, when they accessed it, and what they're doing. With that, it's not to intimidate, but actually to ask for help. If you assume this role, you're in trouble, right? You're trying to fix something, so why don't we go there to ask help? Do you need help? And this is one of the use cases. So, but not only that, oh, it kind of works as a intimidation as well, because it's infrastructure as code, right? And sometime, again, I like Friday's uh, ad hoc experience, so you're there, you, you want to do this deployment, and like, oh yeah, I have to go through my pipeline, I have to change my code, and so, oh, I want to take a beer. So oh, let me just log in with my administrative role here, do this change, and I'll, I, f I figure it out uh, next Monday. Well, if you know that it's going to alert the entire organization, you're not going to do it. So yeah, that also works. Nice, those are the pillars. Uh, those are things that we actually made to change, but they're not all. Oh, we also have given them some golden paths, some guidelines into well, how do you code and what do you do to actually, well, have a very resilient architecture? Some of those, this is a bit of a gray area. Some of those we can actually uh, enforce, but some we can only advise and we can only teach people on what to do. Uh, a good example is the database being private to the accounts. Well, when we deploy, th this, this is enforced by, by, by nature. When we create an account, we also put something there called SCP. It's Service Control Policy on AWS. And those SCPs, they ensure that you can only deploy a persistence layer, so a, uh, dat a database, basically, if it's in the private network. In fact, you can only have load balancers in the public network. This is the only thing we allow in wh when you put it on the public network. This enforces people to have databases private to themselves. And why this is good? Well, you don't want to face an outage. You don't want to face a problem because someone else is running a query on your database and making it unresponsive for you, right? So having this force people to have an API on top of your database. It forces people, force things, to actually create a contracting layer. If I cannot access your data, I need to ask for your data. And if I cannot just give you access to my database, I need to create an API on top of it. And with that, I create a layer in between that allows me to manage who access, how they're going to access my data, and also abstract away. So if, for instance, I want to change my database, I want to do something else, I still have that contract that I need to follow. And the things that are consuming from it, they will not see the underlying change. So I can change from a, uh, database, I can change the flavor, I can change whatever, as long as I keep the contract in place. And this we get by default when we put those SCPs in place for every account. But cache dependencies and backup APIs and graceful degradation, that, that is not a policy we can do for it to happen. During this transition, this is something I didn't spoke uh, yet, but during this transition, we become also a domain-driven company. So everything in our company now tend to go as event. So we went from synchronous architecture to asynchronous event-driven architecture. It's much more complex, but also easy to detach things and make it resilient and reliable. So what you do there, you cache your dependencies. So you have this mission-critical data, you listen to this event, and you cache it. So when someone comes in, you can just look to the data and say, yeah, yeah, I have this information, here it goes. But what if you missed that message for some reason? What if you had an outage or the event source just didn't send a message for an outage or a problem on their side? For that, you need a backup API. So I try to go there. I 
get a request, I don't see the message, I go to the backup API, I fall back to a synchronous architecture, and I get that information. But what if I don't have a backup APIs? Guys, okay, so then you don't have the data. Then you're in a problem, you're in an outer situation, so how can I gracefully degrade? Let me give you an example. Let's say you log into your bank app, and you want to see how much money you have in it, but this API is not responding. If you just say, if you just give an error and say like, hey, sorry, came back later, what do you do? You immediately start refreshing, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to refresh, and you just, as usual, that's natural behavior. We make the problem bigger, because when you refresh, when you try to open the application again, you're increasing the load. You're doing all the APIs that are actually failing, you're calling them again. It's much harder to recover. So, what if, okay, I acknowledge I can't give you how much money you have, but here are the latest transactions you did. It gives you, well, it doesn't yet give you the information, so you, yeah, you still refresh it, you're still not happy with it, but you have something to be entertained with, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah, well, it's not fully down. Cool. So you're not only preventing people, or well, preventing your problem to get bigger, but you're also making people less anxious with that. Serverless first, and infrastructure as code, those we can enforce. When you go to infrastructure as code, and serverless uh, first. So infrastructure as code, I spoke about that already. You, you have your code deployed by a pipeline. No human interaction in there. You create a script, this script does changes in your infrastructure. We enforce it by not giving a right permission to the accounts. So people are forced to go infrastructure as code. I cannot change, I can only look, I can log into my account, but I can only read information in there. I can't do any change. That is an enforcement we do with roles permission. We don't give that role. And about serverless, well, again, SCP, so service control policy, we don't like virtualization in the cloud. Azure VMs, EC2s, we don't, we don't really like those, although there are some exceptions. What we do there is like saying, hey, no, you can't go it. If you, if you want to host your service or if you want to have your database, go to, go to ECS, go to Lambdas, go to Aurora Serverless, but don't have to worry about the machine. You don't need to worry about which CPU flavor you want to use. You don't need to worry about which type of memory or how many, cons how many CPUs is, is on my database. No, you, we want it to be serverless. And we also don't want you to be buying proprietary application, which is very tempting if you have a VM, right? You I can just buy it and I install. It's a Windows uh, uh, application. Yeah, fine, I, s I put a Windows VM in there and I run it. No, we don't want it. So we want you to have proprietary, you, we want you to inner source. We want you to build your own software. So that also helps. And rollback plans, we also cannot enforce. So we need you to think on rollback plans. We need you to think like, hey, I'm creating this uh, uh, change in my database. Should I actually drop my table? Should I actually drop my column? If I have a rollback plan, I know I cannot drop that column because I cannot roll back that column, right? So it forces people to think into steps. Okay, if I need to have a rollback plan, if I need to plan it, I will not drop immediately the column, but I will create a deployment that creates a new column I will populate that column, and if I have to roll back, well, I just delete the column and bring my code back that used the previous one. And then, if it works well, well, my next deployment will then just delete the column. Fine. But you always need a rollback plan. Guys, those are, in a nutshell, the steps we did to actually become more resilient. So, in summary, we learned from this situation that geopolitical situations can actually affect software companies. That you never should waste a good outage, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be uh, uh, doing what we did. So outages are good. They're not per se super bad. Yeah, most of the cases, you're not going to get out of the business with that. So take the time to enjoy the outage, relax, and, and find the best solution for you. And the best way of creating an autonomous team is to actually giving them space. And that a security and resilient architecture 
does never mean micromanagement. If you scope things, if you give them boundaries, but still give them space to explore, to fail, to have the ownership, things themselves will create a resilient, an architect, a resilient architecture by nature. That is it, guys. I hope you enjoyed. So thank you all for it.